Okay, uh, welcome back everybody uh, to our our final keynote talk and uh, it's a real pleasure to have well, our very own Kath, Kath Noakes to give our final keynote. I don't need to give Kath any introduction, she's known to all of you here, so I'm just going to say thanks for speaking Kath. We did have to twist your arm a little bit because you were very reticent, but she's very shy. And she's going to talk to us about the fluid dynamics of infections from science to policy. Thank you, Steve. And yeah, it's a, it is a pleasure to talk, even though maybe I was a little bit reluctant to do it. Um, so, I mean, it's no escape when we had a pandemic and that pandemic really did change um, some areas of fluid dynamics. Uh, I think I was telling somebody an anecdote the other day that I went to APS conference in the US in uh, November 2019 and we went with LIFD and um, at this conference I had a poster on some of the work we've been doing on uh, UV disinfection. I remember saying I think to Steve that See, not many people do what I do here. It's a you know really interesting talks but and apparently that has all changed now. <laughs> so suddenly everybody's interested in this field. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a bit about a lot of some of what happened during the pandemic. I'll, I'll give you a bit of a flavour of some of the research that people at Leeds got involved with, some of which I was very heavily involved with and led others that other people here and, and across campus were involved in. And then just give a little bit of reflection on my roles and what I've learned about policy and the way the science goes into those policy aspects. Um, I guess to start with, you know, yes, COVID was a massive um, challenge worldwide, but I think it's worth putting in saying that there's a lot more to respiratory disease than just COVID. Um, and if you look at the data from WHO, this is 2019 data on the leading causes of death globally. Um, and you can see that lower respiratory infections come in at number four. They may well be higher now because COVID is not in this data. But even without that, there are many of those others, heart disease, stroke, COPD, Alzheimer's, uh, trachea bronchus and lung cancers, all of which have a relationship to respiratory system and air quality. So there's a huge aspect of this, which is about the air that we breathe, what's in the air that we breathe and how um, that affects human health. And then if we go much closer to home. So this is UK data on um, numbers of deaths per week and shows where we have excess deaths. And the big grey spikes, the pale grey spikes are the COVID deaths. But the others are the, the red lines, are influenza. There are some blue lines are COVID because once we've got past those, the, the two really big peaks, then we're measuring it in the normal death rates. Um, and actually the green lines are to do with excess temperature weather events. And what you see is, although COVID was a, a very distinctive, you know, spike, way more than we're used to, every year, or nearly every year, we get excess deaths in the winter caused by respiratory infections, mostly influenza, but so many other things as well. So this is not a new problem. And so understanding transmission of disease is quite important. There's also the societal impact. So think about the past three months or so, stick your hand up if you've had a cold, COVID, flu, something like that. Nearly everybody in the room. Keep your hand up if you had to take time off work. Yeah, quite a few people. Keep your hand up, put your hand up if your kids had time off school. Yes, <laughs> it's a very enthusiastic one there. OK, so there's quite a lot of impacts of this. Um, on the right, you've got workplace absences. Um, this is ONS data. It's a bit hard to find where respiratory comes into this because it can, partially comes under minor illnesses for things like colds and that, but then other includes COVID. And you can see how 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, that other has become quite significant. And we know in 2022, there's over 185 million work days lost due to sickness in the UK. Big portion of that is mental health, and musculoskeletal things, but a big chunk is to do with respiratory infections. And then in school absence, you can again see, if you look at the data, 
how illness absence has jumped from sort of around about the two, two and a half percent mark up to over four percent in 2021-22 in schools. And that partially is to do with COVID. And it has a massive impact, it has a massive impact on education, has a massive impact on productivity, has a massive impact on the economy. So understanding transmission of infections is pretty important. Okay, how does it all happen? Well, we go back in time, go back into the 1800s and be, before that we had the miasma theory where people believed everything was in the air and the smell and cholera. There's a classic picture of a cholera, which is the miasma in the air because it did stink because at the time. Some of that was right. People like Florence Nightingale worked out in the 1800s that actually air mattered to transmission infection and advocated for wards in hospitals which were designed around ventilation as well as around light, spacing and sanitation. But if we go into the sort of early 1900s or late 1800s, early 1900s, we learned more about transmission disease. We learned about germ theory. We learned about microorganisms. And we also then learnt, um, in some ways, in the wrong way. So ex people carried out experiments um, around the turn of the century. Um, a guy called Carl Fluger did stuff on droplets, um, where he had um, people measured the bacteria from people's mouths, saw that it was travelled over fairly big distances, it settled out onto plates, often over several hours. So he kind of recognised the air and these droplets mattered. And there was a guy called Charles Chapin in the US who had an unfortunate influence on the whole system because he rightly recognised that when somebody's close, they're more likely to be infected, but interpreted that wrong as it's big droplets that deposit out, as opposed to the, the plume of aerosols is more concentrated at close range. And that then set into stone for many, many years that droplets were a problem and droplets as in spit droplets or droplets at deposit. And you can see this is for tuberculosis poster from uh, probably about 150 years ago on do not spit. We know now that tuberculosis is transmitted in the air. There were people who were changing this, though, so particular guy was a guy called William Wells at Harvard and his wife Mildred. They, uh, William Wells came at this more from an aerosol physics perspective than just a medical perspective, but he kind of realised that when we breathe out, we cough or whatever, we produce this range of different sizes of particles and they behave in different ways. And he went, hang on a minute, these are liquid particles. It's a respiratory fluid, they're going to evaporate. And he proposed this concept, what he called a droplet nuclei. And basically, it's almost Stokes law this, you take a, a droplet of a particular diameter, drop it from two metres above the ground, which sizes will, will evaporate before they hit the ground versus which sizes just hit the ground. And it's, the cutoff, it's, he's showing it at around about 170 microns there. We often say somewhere in above about 100 microns tend to behave fairly ballistically the smaller than 100 microns will evaporate. Some of those will still deposit, but they take longer. We also have to remember that viruses and bacteria don't travel alone. They're not naked particles. They travel in this respiratory fluid. And this respiratory fluid is not just water. It's got all sorts of other things in it, salts and proteins and surfactants and other microorganisms from your, your biome. And when, so when they evaporate, they don't just evaporate to nothing they evaporate to a minimum size based on the properties of that fluid. And there's a lot of active work trying to understand that process even now. And I mentioned about TB. So I mentioned Wells already. Uh, Wells is the guy in the black and white picture. He teamed up with the other guy called Richard Riley. They carried out a really seminal study um, in Baltimore in the late 50s and early 60s. They took from this bedroom here um, TB patient wards and they pass the air through ventilation ducts up into a cage in the roof where there were guinea pigs and the guinea pigs got TB and the fact the only way the guinea pigs could have got TB is via the air tells us that those the bacteria mycobacterium tuberculosis that causes TB had to be carried in the air and had to be breathed in. They also put UV lights in 
their wards and showed that less guinea pigs got infected when there's UV lights there. So showed that UV, the, the damages the DNA of microorganisms and therefore it disinfects and reduces transmission. But they wouldn't have been able to do that experiment had they not thought about the airflow. You had to think there's actually quite an engineering aspect to this of having those ducts, having the, the guinea pig cages enabling that airflow. And we actually repeated that experiment in about um, 2003. Um, I, I was involved in it with a, a colleague who led it in, from Imperial uh, down in Peru. And we measured all the airflows in that one. And being able to measure the airflows and measure the infection rates allows you to quantify things. So let's take us to present day. OK, so this was a piece of work that we we did during COVID because there was an awful lot of debate about transmission. How was it transmitted? And it can be transmitted like many viruses through multiple different routes. So the simplest way of saying we can transmit it long range through the air, so beyond two or three metres, sharing the air in a room, even sharing the air in the next room. It can be transmitted at close range, inhaled through those smaller aerosols, um, but even the sort of larger droplet, something like a 100 micron droplet, can be inhaled when you're fairly close to somebody. But it can also end up on surfaces, and we know that it can end up on surfaces by deposition, and then people touch those surfaces. But it also ends up on surfaces, um, anyone with kids knows this, with colds, that contaminated hand, you cough, you sneeze into your hand, you've contaminated your hand, you touch things. Think about it in your home, how many surfaces you touch. You think about you go in the kitchen, how many surfaces you touch that everybody else in your household also touches. The tap, the kettle handle, the door handle, the table, all sorts of things. Even though we've, even now, we don't know the relative um, contribution of these different aspects. We suspect that inhalation dominates and therefore air and airborne close range are the two dominant modes, but we can't be absolutely sure of that. So I don't think we can ever dismiss one at this stage. Interestingly for TB, you pretty much can because to be infected with TB, you have to receive that particle down into your deep lung to cause infection. So it has to be less than five microns in size. For COVID, you have receptors for the virus all the way through your respiratory system, in your nose, in your mouth, all the way through the system. So kind of any size of particle can do it. Um, let's say this piece of work was one where we actually did an expert elicitation. We asked people, epidemiologists, people who worked in virology, people who worked in um, in more aerosol science type and engineering space and ask them about what happened on each of these little routes. What do they think the contributions were? Um, and we saw quite a range, quite a divergence of different opinions there. It'd be really interesting to repeat this and see whether we've got more convergence and things. But we took all of that data and used it to do a, if you actually go on the, M the MJ website, you can play with the sliders on this and put things in place to look at relative effects. But ultimately, there's a number of factors which affect this. So the fluid dynamics plays out throughout the whole system, right the way through how droplets and aerosols are generated within the human respiratory system, how they're released, where they go in the environment. I kind of don't need to tell you this, you know the fluid dynamics bit. The environmental conditions play a big part, whether it's to do with temperature, humidity, uh, UV light, etc. The virus characteristics play a part, so different viruses will survive in the environment in different ways. Some are more robust, others will die very quickly. And some of those viruses you might need to um, be exposed to a very high amount to become infected. Others, it might be tiny amounts. We think that the, the infectious dose for COVID is very low. So it is, it's also true for norovirus. And again, anybody with children, knows full well how easy it is to catch norovirus off your kids. So certain things have very low infectious doses. Others, um, Mpox, which was previously known as monkeypox, is a good example. If you go and sample an environment for monkeypox, you find the virus everywhere. You find it on surfaces, you find it in the air. But people were clearly only transmitting it at very close proximity. We weren't seeing transmission. So 
it's very likely that means the, the threshold infectious dose is much higher. The last one on the list is human behaviour, um, which is the big problem. OK, if we didn't have people in buildings, if we didn't have people in environments, everything would be a lot easier. OK, <laughs> and just think about your simulations. It's so much easier if you don't have people in them. The problem is if people don't behave as an idealised way and people do weird things. So we have to think about how we understand that. You, know, you all think that you don't touch your face very often, but lots of people do particularly people with beards, Andrew. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, um, everybody says they don't pick their nose. They're quite likely to be lying when they say that. OK, so there's, there's an awful lot of behaviours that play into things, these things. Back to the pandemic. Um, you all remember, wash your hands and sing happy birthday. I'm sure you all do it, don't you? Um, you shouldn't stop washing your hands. Washing your hands is really important. But we really had this focus on fomites and surfaces. And at the beginning, people said, hang on a minute, have we thought about everything? We saw very early on in sort of February, March 2020, we saw some red flags. The one on the, the top was a restaurant outbreak in China where transmission happened at more than two metres and the CCTV data couldn't explain it by touch. And then there was a classic one which was in America, Skagit Choir outbreak where there was one known person with symptoms. There may have been another, we don't know. And 87% um, of that group developed COVID-19. And sadly, a couple of them died in that case. But you can't, it's really hard to say in that two-hour choir practice, surely they didn't all touch the same door handle and get infected that way. It doesn't make sense. So the red flags were there for airborne transmission. And that prompted a lot of people to start working on this. So suddenly huge amounts of work started. People rightly started to think about transmission. Um, two things happened. One, lots of people did CFD models. Um, those early CFD models were not necessarily the greatest. You know, there's a lot of people standing in wind tunnels um, and that's just not real life. And not think, thinking about particles, but not thinking about the virus that's carried in those particles. But the other thing that happened was people latched onto simple models um, and particularly something called a Wells-Riley model. So Wells-Riley model has been around since the 1960s, named after William Wells and Richard Riley. Um, and it's a really simple box model. It basically treats a room as a well-mixed space. You've got a concentration of virus in the air, depending on how much somebody emits. You breathe it in. It's built in with a dose response function and you um, people become infected and people are assumed to emit this virus uh, called quanta, which is the number of infectious doses at a particular rate. And if you do a model like this, you'll get a results which looks something like this. So this is from the paper we did actually looking at the Skagit choir outbreak, um, trying to think, well, what would be the, the, the emission rates from that really high because it's probably a super spreader event. But you can see it loss rate is think of that as ventilation rate, but it could also include decay and deposition. As that increases, the probability of infection decreases. Lots of people use this early days and produced models, produced things which showed, um, like you know, use them as a, a tool to help people do risk assessments in buildings. The problem is, is that only thinking about the air in a well mixed sense. And therefore, if you only model the air, you think everything's airborne because you don't think about anything else. You can do more with this. This is Alex's work, who's sitting at the back there. We can, one of the issues is most of these are steady state and single zone. So, you know, we've worked to extend this and think about people moving between different spaces. This is a healthcare worker moving between different zones of a hospital and how that might expose patients. So that is one step towards addressing some of the limitations with these models, but it still doesn't address what happens when you're closer. Uh, proximity. So when we think about what happens closer, we already know this, we're going to get different sizes of aerosols and droplets generated. Data from way before the pandemic shows we've got these big size ranges that people produce and they produce different things when they do different activities. We've got different modes of production. So some of it's thought to be to do with film burst when breathing, some of it's in, when you talk or speak, and then some of it's from your mouth, those sort of more spit droplets. We know from data, if we just measure 
aerosol particles, and this is not thinking about virus at all, just measure aerosol particles, we can see that if you speak or sing more loudly, you produce typically more particles. If you cough, you typically produce more particles. But with all of these, there's some big ranges. I think there's 26 people in here. Some people breathe out as much as other people cough out. So there's some really wide variations, and that's just particle measurement. So what about viruses? Actually measuring viruses or part of bacteria is really hard. Uh, this is from 1966 with a machine that somebody had developed called the Gazun type machine, which is a cone where somebody was, you basically breathe or cough into this cone, and then that goes into a biological samplers to try and measure what's being emitted. And this has actually been developed further. This is the Gazun type two machine. Um, which was developed by uh, Professor Don Milton at the University of Maryland. And essentially the same idea, you put your head in a cone, it's got uh, uh, different types of particle samplers in it, so it will, it will measure particles, uh, the larger particles above about five micron, which will go into an impactor plate, smaller ones which will go into a condensation counter, which is below. And they can measure RNA, and they can also culture it for live virus. And they've done this for influenza, so this is influenza data. You can see, as you might expect, people who cough produce more than people who don't cough. But you also see there's nearly as much viral RNA in the small as in the coarse, if not more. OK, and look again at the orders of magnitude. It's about four orders of magnitude variation across your different participants. If you do COVID, I haven't put the COVID data on here, you see the same thing. Um, this instrument is probably the best we have in the world for being able to measure virus from emissions from people, but it's a huge complicated thing. It's really hard to do. On top of that, those complexities of the actual virus, is it viruses, is it particles, size distributions, etc. We also know we have complexities of real world flows. We have differences in ventilation. Um, so the, the top image is um, from Dant. Is anybody still here from Cambridge? Anybody's visited Cambridge? There? If, if you go in their classrooms at certain times, they stratify beautifully. Um, they stratify about breathing height, which is exactly what you don't want. Um, although admittedly it's empty at, the, at that time. Um, the bottom one, again from Alex's work, is a simulation building over a period of six months and looking at just how the weather might change concentrations. That CO2 concentrations, imagine that was virus. Which day of the week are you going to go into the hospital? Gives your risk change depending on the weather. So we've got all of these other complexities that we have to build in. So there was some question, and this came early days in the pandemic. What do we need? What do we know? Can we throw immediate information out? Then it was, we've got a lot of unknowns. So can we characterize that? So I'm going to talk about data from three projects, one called the Protect National Core Study, which was a vast government funded initiative, 200 scientists, um, 37 projects under that across the UK, which was all looking at this whole complex thing of transmission and the environment. Project we ran called TRAC, which was initiated by the Department for Transport to say what happens on tra public transport and how risky is it. And then the other one is a GCRF project, which was Amir Khan and Zia Wadud, who, who were looking at transport in developing countries. And we wanted to think about the whole complex aspects of it, and particularly going to focus on some CFD and something called quantitative microbial risk assessment. Um, but first, there's also one of the parts of this was thinking about what data can we get and input data. So this was a part of the PROTECT study. Um, on the uh, left, it's data from the University of Leicester. I mentioned that Gazun type machine, really hard to measure virus. What they can do is put these little strips into simple masks, duck bill masks, and then they can measure RNA. And the graph shows you that on the left of the graph where it says FMS, that's a measuring RNA by the face masks and measuring how much transmission happens in a household. And on the right is what's called a, is the swab that we'd be used to using. And you can see that the household transmission is better. Um, we see, we see more 
association with the viral load and transmission than we do with the, with the swabs. We also, on the right, we're thinking, well, can we adapt this? Can we, instead of using these masks, these just straightforward duckbill masks, which don't do any size segregation, can we do a size segregated mask? And this is work that was led by Gareth Keeble and Dave Hodgson, um, Nick Kapoor was involved, Jim McQuaid at Leeds, and um, Caroline Marshall, who's one of the CDT students, uh, followed by Wasim, who, are, who, who were doing some of the, the work on this. And basically, first of all, characterising flows in masks, and then trying to design a mask which had a two-stage component to it, which could capture virus at different stages. And that's still ongoing work. We're trying to get a PhD student to continue that work and to really prove it. But we got the initial proof of concept from the fluid dynamics aspects of it. From a CFD perspective, the CFD was really collaborative um, and was uh, a little bit University of Leeds, but majority of that work was carried out by scientists at HSE and DSTL. And I can see Rory's in the room who was came into this um, when he was part, partly as a CDT student and then went on to do some more of this work when he went to HSE. We were looking at can we develop a simplified model of these respiratory emissions that captures the evaporation, captures the different respiratory activities, captures spatial variation in distribution, and that we could validate with some real world data. So worked with the UK Health Security Agency to do some measurements on surfaces and in air. We we're able to show some air, interesting airflow effects. So you can see the thermal plume of the person, which is carries those particles in the air and carries them across the room and over time and drops them around the room. So we were able to sort of start to understand how these different factors all integrate together. We were able to use this um, to feed into advice around things like ventilation and screens. So this is just showing how the how the effect of a screen actually when you're very close to somebody over a short time period, it's quite useful. But over a longer period of time, those particles disperse around the room and you will be exposing everybody. Yeah. Um, and then we were able to take this and not just model the particles, but think about the viral load that's in each particle, how that changes you know, as they evaporate. Um, those, those will become more concentrated and think about exposure. And so this is a model. If you look carefully, there's a, a person standing in a, a vast meeting room. The spidery things are the ventilation flows coming into that room. So it's the, the, these four four way diffusers that you get very commonly in rooms. So we got the uh, ventilation in this room. And then we looked at what happened to different sizes of particles. So the top one, the right, are these ballistic droplets. So these are the ones which just behave ballistically. They drop out. They drop out within about a meter, as you might expect immediately in front of the person. The bottom ones, these are the ones that are start life below about 20 microns. They evaporate, they become much smaller and they essentially get carried and mixed throughout the vast majority of the room. So that's your kind of classic airborne. The ones in the middle are really interesting because they're the ones that start life between about 20 and 100 microns. And they start, they evaporate, but they don't fully evaporate. So you can see that some of them deposit out, but some of them get carried off in the air. And we think those could actually be your really dangerous particles because they're bigger, they can carry more virus, and they stay airborne for longer than you think they should in certain circumstances. And we were able to plot some of these things out and look at the exposure. So this is actual trying to now characterize virus exposure rather than just particle behavior, virus exposure with distance under different humidities. And the important thing is, is the first one red is not to one meters. The second one is one to two meters and the green is two to three meters. It's about two to three meters where you can see it starts to drop. Um, and we were really surprised at this. This came well after the two meter rule. And we had a lot of debate about the two meter rule, but it was really interesting that the physics actually played into supporting that when you start to model it properly and put all of the factors in. Um, I mentioned the public transport one. So again, this is a real example of how we brought together lots of different people and lots of different specialisms to 
understand something quite complex. So the department for transport, transport operators are kind of going, how on earth do we manage risk on public transport? Public transport uh, patronage dropped massively. How do they get some of that back? So we put together this project about how do we develop a risk model. Martin Lopez Garcia was very heavily involved in this as well. We brought together understanding of people, understanding of microbes, understanding of some of the behaviours and understanding of the environment um, from a sort of multidisciplinary team from um, I think it was eight different partners. And the key thing that uh, we led on was around developing a risk model for this. So this was an agent based model where individuals got on, on board a, a subway, an underground, a bus, a train. They boarded and alighted in different patterns. We seeded the model with lots of these people and they did lots of journeys. And then we applied some of the physics, but we applied simplified physics. So we had a well mixed ventilation. We had, but we had some zonal effects that you got um, uh, risk changed with distance for different size droplets. And we also thought about what ended up on surfaces, who touched which surfaces and put all of that into this stochastic model and then created cumulative doses which then allowed us to say, OK, what happens if the ventilation rate is improved or what happens if people wear masks, etc. Um, so it allowed us to change some of these factors, which then allow advice to be given to the public transport operators. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is our, our bus. You become quite interesting. You, 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 you want data for these models, so you end up on the bus spotter websites, and this is quite fascinating. Um, so we have this single decker bus. We did, did the whole of the geometry of this and so people could sit in certain places. We had like poles in so people could touch certain surfaces. Um, we had loading patterns for different stops on that journey. And then we can plug all of these things into some of the models. And this is just a snapshot of a couple of the results. So we, we brought out the results in terms of the total dose, but also how much was in the air, how much could be on the surfaces and how much was close range. And, as you might expect, if you're close to somebody who's infected, that's quite a high risk, but it actually happens fairly infrequently because you're not necessarily always that close. The surfaces was really interesting because it's maybe because public transport is a high touch environment and we were assuming people a lot of the time were not wearing masks and would cough on their hands and things like that. But if you've got contaminated hands, you see that potentially you can get really quite high doses sometimes uh, from the, the fomites, the surfaces, more than, and we, that was a real surprise to us when we were running these models. And we spent a lot of time going back and saying, did we get this right? Um, but it is, it's sort of also borne out in some of the data that we have measured in some of the public transport settings. But interestingly, the air becomes quite an interesting one because it's the smallest dose, but you end up with this really high peak. And what you end up with is that if somebody is infected, everybody gets exposed to the air. They don't all get exposed to close range or the surfaces, but everybody gets the air. Now, if that dose is really small, it might not matter. But if you've got the super spreader on there, you, you suddenly create a high risk. Um, and we also started to look at different transport options and you realise long distance trains are actually your highest risk. Short journeys on the bus, you're not there for very long, probably don't pose much of a risk. Part of it, we also looked a bit at flows. So this is from Chris Payne's group at Imperial, who were looking at using their AI based fluids models to model um, people moving and people walking to get the, those complex flows that are happening. And then we also did an awful lot of measurements using, again, which was led by Cambridge University, looking at measuring carbon dioxide concentrations. That's a proxy for exhaled breath, tells you something about the ventilation. A uh, big discovery was that uh, train standards in the UK and across Europe um, do not have a ventilation standard that's designed for people. They have a 5,000 parts per million um, limit on it, which is basically the, the health and safety threshold. Contrast that to buildings, we set a design standard typically of about 1,000 parts per million. So lots of train companies will tell you that their trains meet standards. They absolutely do meet standards. It's just the standard is complete rubbish. Um, last one is going to mention, which I think this is the one Rory did, which was the ride sharing activity. So this is uh, looking at uh, shared motorbikes in places like uh, Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, looking at 
the risk of two people on a motorbike can it be safe and this was a cfd study where they were um amir led this study but looking at if you've got your dri dri driver who's who's um infected and they cough where do those particles go and if you put a shield between uh, the rider and the passenger how does that affect risk and of course the shield does make quite a big difference there may be a stability of bike question there that comes into it though um and I'm conscious of running out of time here that we did start there, didn't we? So um, I just wanted to kind of finish up by talking about the feed into policy. So I think you're probably all aware that I had quite an involvement in this. Go back to March 2020, I, I just started to get involved with some pandemic work. NHS Scotland did come and ask questions about ventilation. In that early days, they were frantically changing over parts of their hospital to become intensive care units and could this pose risks and how did we manage this? And then uh, 7th of April, I think it was, I got a call from Go Government Office for Science. Would I do a paper for SAGE? Um, that was a, quite a shock. Um, worked with colleagues across Leeds, um, a few of whom are here, to put this evidence paper together on what about transmission. And just to give you an idea of the timescales, I got that phone call on the 7th of April. I took it to Sage on the 14th of April and we had the Easter weekend between the two. Um, so that was that was probably the fastest literature review any of us have ever written. <laughs> um, and there's a good example of teamwork where we split it up and different people went and found evidence for different bits of it. Um, so I was very heavily involved in Sage after that point um, and um, was involved in chairing the environment modelling group. And we were essentially had a huge barrage of questions that come at the beginning because we were in that period, we were in a lockdown, we need to come out of that lockdown. Every government department wanted to know how do we make things safe? Um, what do we know? And we didn't know very much at that time. We were starting to get evidence around survival of the virus and where it had been sampled, but there was a lot of technique development still being doing then. So we had to draw a lot on past experience and then bring in new experience as we went through. Um, it was a very interdisciplinary thing. We brought in a lot of expertise, including people at Leeds who fed into little pieces of this. Um, but I learned a huge amount about how you put evidence together. My decision makers need that scientific evidence. They need the credibility of that scientific evidence. And you need to be really clear about what you know, what you don't know, and where your uncertainties are. Um, and it was really critical for us because, I gave you an example at the beginning, airborne transmission was still very uncertain and we said there's emerging evidence but we said it's very uncertain i don't think we could have said more than that you can't say my gut instinct is because that doesn't hold with a decision maker they have to have evidence base or to understand where that lack of evidence is we also realized there's a huge complexity to this so although i very much come from a, an engineering and the physics side of this things like the ventilation, um, the, the physics of fluids and thinking about those aspects I've already talked about. There's a huge range of other factors that play into this as well, including many social factors. Um, and I'll give you an example. We had saw outbreaks quite early on in the pandemic in um, meat processing factories. And immediately, one of the first thoughts was, is this environmental? Is this because these have poor ventilation? They have very they have closed environments to maintain particular temperature and humidity. They're often cold environments and they were perpetuating transmission. And that was part of the problem. There was definitely evidence for that. But another massive part of the problem was a these workplaces stayed open during the height of the pandemic um, because they had to. We all had to carry on eating and these workplaces often employed um, low paid workers, agency workers, migrant workers. They shared housing together. They had low wages. They traveled together in cars or buses together. And a lot of the transmission was associated with environmental factors linked to their workplace rather than in the workplace itself. And we could see that when we went into workplaces, and HSC did a lot of inspections. They spotted out that people in many of things like the factory floors were applying things really well, but you found pockets of air issues in things like locker rooms, 
or the canteen, particularly the night shift in the canteen when nobody's looking. So there's all sorts of social things play into this as well that just aren't captured in the physics type models. I touch on the media as well. So um, the media showed an enormous amount of science and a lot of that was incredibly good and incredibly valuable. So um, I, the one on the, the left was a really good example um, from Spain where they put this amazing sort of uh, describer about ventilation and transmission and how things worked. But there were others that went up and I am going to pick out this top one of a computer model which showed it was fairly early in the pandemic this one April 2020 showed how far a cough can spread indoors and this is a point bear in mind people are quite fearful at this point and you see that simulation and that looks like my hospital my, my uh, supermarket aisles are filled with gas now um, because of course these particles are really tiny but in your sim CFD simulation they're the size of tennis balls um, and I think some of these played into some of the fears that people saw and we'd be you know we have to be really careful about how we communicate it I think fluid dynamics is an area where the visuals can be incredibly powerful but they might not necessarily tell you the right story so getting that message right this was a massive challenge it still is a massive challenge. Policymakers, particularly MPs, really want a simple answer. They want a magic bullet. If we buy this, will it solve it all? I'm sorry, but no, there isn't one. The real world of it is complex. It's emerging. It's changed. Changing evidence is really hard to get across to people. Some of it was embedded beliefs. So the challenges around droplets and surfaces versus the air. You're trying to get a different message across. You're trying to work out how what you can do from some simple scenario, how you can translate that across to different settings, where the limitations are, and trying to explain that to decision makers. And balancing things, it'd be great to say, let's go and revamp all the ventilation in every hospital in the country and every school in the country. I really, really wish we could, but there is not the money to do that, and it was not going to happen any day soon. So we have to think about what those practical things we can do are what you do in the height of a pandemic versus what you do the rest of the time and what you do the rest of the time possibly should prepare for your pandemic do we see any change yes we do so we see change for two reasons one is there has been a direct impact of the pandemic work royal academy of engineering did a big piece on infection resilient environments that fed into government the building regulations did get updated and they do actually acknowledge infectious disease now and put higher ventilation rate requirements in. We've got new guidance in for NHS hospitals. And then sadly, because of other things, so particularly the death of Awa Bishak, who's a little boy in Rochdale who died of the exposure to mould in his council, uh, his social housing. He that has raised up the profile of indoor air quality and other risks more generally. And Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, picked up on this and other things. And his annual report 2022 focused on air pollution and included a whole chapter that he asked us to write on indoor air, which was great. Um, so indoor air quality, not so much infectious disease, but indoor air quality has become a bit of a priority. It's there with the chief medical officer. It's there with um, Michael Gove's department. That's the second good thing we've said about Michael Gove today. I'm a bit worried, um, but it is there. It's slow. It takes time, but there is a change. So just to wrap up a couple of things, future research. The past four years have seen more research in this area than have been in this area for like the previous 50 or 60 years. Um, but there's an awful lot of it is very incremental or, or doesn't change much and I think we really need to think more about the applicability in the real world of this there's an awful lot of very simplified models when you build a model you bake in a set of assumptions by the time you run that model and get further down the line you often forget about what you assumed at the beginning but some of these assumptions are really important we lack the validation data it's actually really hard to do a an outbreak model in a hospital and then find something to validate it against. Um, there's a lot of things that are uncertain, a variable, very uncertain variable over very big ranges, and that's quite hard to put into things. And things don't happen in nice, easy, 
steady state. They happen transiently over time. So we need to do a lot more thinking about real world and think about how you model humans in the loop of this. And the only reason anything has happened and anything will continue to happen is through cross-discipline work. All the things which have been most impactful have been cross-discipline collaborations, and we need to keep that going. And then thinking into policy, um, I've been very privileged to be able to be in a position where I could feed into policy and could feed into policy really quite high levels. But we need to get more of our research into policy, in front of policymakers on a more regular basis. And that's not just, um, there's, there's different ways of doing that. We need to put fluid dynamics in there. And we as a group need the skills to communicate how the fluid dynamics, what that means in practice, needs to the public, needs to policymakers. So that's thinking about stuff without jargon, thinking about being able to balance evidence, being able to talk about uncertainty. And I've just put some ideas of things that you can do. And if you're a PhD student, many of these things are open to you to get involved in. I think Kira mentioned earlier, the policy internship. You had a great time, didn't you? Yeah. And it, it really allows you to see how the science translates into policy making. So to leave me to say a thank you. Thank you to lots of people at Leeds and all around the country who were involved in a huge amount of work here. And that's me done. Sorry, I've gone over.